Well, good morning, everybody. Good to see all of you joining us here in the church and all those who are joining us through Facebook Live. Welcome to you, wherever you are in the world. Last week, we had almost 3,000 people uh, viewing us in our worship, either on Sunday, last Sunday, or during the course of this week. So, welcome to our worldwide family of Methodist International Friends. Uh, it's good to be here. Where, where denominations have closed all their churches down. Uh, Roman Catholics have closed their churches. The Anglicans have closed their churches. But the Methodists are going to keep going. We might reduce our services, but we're going to keep going. We're going to keep worshipping. And I think that's important. I hope you've all sanitized your hands, wearing your mask, and ready to go for worship this morning. We come together to worship God. It's really important that, you know, in these days of difficulty and struggle, that uh, we come together as Christians actually to worship and to keep the hope of God alive in our communities. And that's what we're doing today as we gather to worship and as we send this message out and this worship out to all the world. That's fantastic. So we praise God for creativity and the wonder of technology. It's brilliant. So thanks be to God. We come together to worship God. Let's pray together as we begin our time and let's reaffirm Our faith in Jesus and in the power of God for healing, well-being. As we remind ourselves again of God's sovereignty over all things, over our lives, over his church and over the world. And we pray, O oh God, for these extraordinary times that we live through here in Hong Kong, but in many parts of the world too, that you, God, will continue to sustain us. And fill us with hope, even when the days seem dark indeed. Father, we thank you that you've called your people to come together here to worship you. And you've called people to tune in all around the world. And we pray that as we worship together, you'd fill this place with praise and worship. For you have called us. And so we have come. So, Father, in this place, fill this space, this place with your holy presence. That all who gather here might feel it and experience it. And all who, who tune in all around the world might also hear it, feel it, experience your presence. So, Holy Spirit of God, come and fall upon us now in this time of worship. Bring your healing and wholeness, your mercy, your grace and your power. Into our lives we pray. For we ask this in the name and for the, for the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. God is indeed calling us. Let's stand and sing, you're calling us. You're calling us. You're calling us, and so we are gathered here. You're building us into a house of prayer. A holy place. A holy place where stories of grace are told. A sacred space where miracles are
come before you to worship you, to gather here, to lift our eyes upon you, upon your saving cross. The most important thing is not whether we are physically here or we are listening, watching online. But the most important thing is if our hearts are connected to you, Lord. Jeremiah 31. You said, I have loved you with an everlasting love. I have drawn you with an unfailing kindness. And we know that the response won from us is to praise you, to worship you in all our hearts and mind and soul. And now praise is rising. May you take joy in all our worship. Amen. Brothers and sisters, praise is rising. Praise. thank you that it's you who invite us to come. It's not me. It's not the Methodist Church. But it's you, God. You are the one who invites us. You are the one who calls us here to this place and into worshipping you. And of course, worship is far beyond this hour or so that we spend together. But you invite us to worship with our whole lives, giving everything that we have and all that we are into your presence, not into the presence of the Methodist Church, not into the presence of Eden, the pastor, but into the presence of the living, holy, amazing God. And so, Father, we thank you for that call upon our lives to be here today. What a joy, what a privilege, what an honor to be here today, worshiping with our fellow Christians and disciples 
offering our whole selves, our hearts, our lives. Father, you know that some of us come and we feel broken, we feel torn, we, we feel anxious, we feel fearful. We're worried about so many things. But in your presence, in your presence there is joy. In your presence there is peace. In your presence there is healing. In your presence we find a proper perspective on our life and on the life of the world and Hong Kong. And so today as we worship you, as we lift your name in praise, may we receive all that we need and all that we desire in you, God. We're sorry, God, that we, we often don't trust you for things. We often try to, to work things out on our own, to, to manipulate and to, to make things happen. But you show us, sometimes through pain and suffering, that that's not the way. The way is to trust completely in you and to offer everything to you. And then you, you will work in our lives, in the church, in Hong Kong. So God help us as we come together today to offer everything to you. Everything. Our brokenness, our hurt, our pain, our suffering and our joy. Offer it all into your presence today. So that as we offer everything, as we offer our future, we might know your peace descending upon us in this worship time. Father, you have called us together today to hear your voice. And so may we, through scripture and prayer and worship, through the notices even, hear your voice speaking to us. Come and comfort and heal and strengthen and speak words of peace. Breathe your breath into our lives afresh today, O oh God. And so, Father, we worship you, we, we adore you. We love you, and that's why we're here. So, Holy Spirit, come and minister to us today and throw us out into all the world or wherever people are watching and listening. Minister your grace and your healing and your power for your praise and for your glory. We pray this through the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And let's say the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. The kingdom, the power and the glory are yours forever and forever. Amen. Amen. Please do be seated. I think we're into our fifth week of the preaching series on, uh, entitled In the Beginning. And this, today we reach uh, chapter 6 and 8 of Genesis and we look at the story of Noah and the great flood that came upon the earth and the rainbow that followed uh, those flood waters dissipating. And I know that King is going to come and share something of Noah and his flood. With however many children are here. <laughs> okay, so I just request the children to be on your seats, so it's okay. And for those who are watching us, and um, I would like to have six, uh, six volunteers for today's message. So can you just come forward? Any random people can help me with this wonderful message. Yes, thank you. One, two, three. The tallest will stand here. And then we will do like a triangle. Okay? One, then Rebecca here. And Caroline. Oh, I need more. Yes, thank you. And then one more here. And then, yes, we may here. Maybe you can stand here. Yes. And then one more. One more. One, two, two, four, five. Okay, you just stand there. There. Okay, so as I will be telling this story, I asked Gary and surprised him this morning. He will play a very soft music. Those moments, you know, all the people are very rude when God created the world. It's, 
people are becoming rude. They are killing each other. They are cheating each other. And they are lying. They don't listen to their parents and to their families. They become so bad. And then one time God said, okay, I, 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 I will ask Noah, who is very faithful to me, that he will build an ark. He will build an ark so that um, our world will be washed away. And, you know, the people are laughing, saying, why? Why are you building, <laughs> building an ark in this very, very hot season? The people are laughing, laughing. But Noah was able to complete and trust God that he will make it. And, you know, he builds an ark. And here comes a rain, a thunder, and everyone on the boat are very afraid. Noah was so afraid, and his family, and he is so worried. You know, Noah is so worried. Um, the animals, they don't know if they will still have food to eat. And then some of the people outside, they are already dying. And um, the, the whole earth is full with flood. And uh, everyone on the ship, they are just afraid. And they are saying, oh, I'm worrying. Can you stand there, Gabriel? Yeah. And we are worrying. We are afraid that maybe we will be out of resources. But you know what happened is that after 40 days and 40 nights, Noah and his family and the animals inside. I didn't elaborate the story because I know you already know this story. They came out and you know, the God protected and cared for them. They are all alive. Sometimes in our lives, we have worries, right Gabriel? We have worries. But if we trust God like Noah, it can turn this, you know, you just say, oh, I trusted God and He cared for me. And we just we are just surprised on how God can work in the midst of all our fears and all of our doubts. Like the Lord has protected Noah. All of our worries and all of our fears, if we gave it to God and we trust it to God, all those dark moments in our lives, they can become colorful. As God has promised Noah, I will send the rainbow and I will make everything bright because I am with you and I am your God. And this is a sign. This is not a rainbow, but let us be reminded today that wherever you are, whatever you are experiencing this moment, how negative it is, you are thinking badly and it seems that God is not there. Remember the story of Noah that even in the dark times of 40 days and 40 nights, he sent a rainbow and said, I am with you. Shall we all pray? Heavenly Father God, you are with us. You are our God, and thank you for reminding us that even how dark our life is, you are our God, and you will make our life bright. In Jesus' name, amen. You can keep that to remind yourself that God is with you. And thank you for volunteering. Thanks, King. <clears throat> Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Caroline. I'm your duty steward for this morning, together with Darwin. Um, it's great to see you here. It's great to worship together. Um, this is actually my favorite part of the week. I don't know about you. Um, <laughs> um, and welcome to everyone who's watching at home on Facebook Live. Good to see you. Well, I can't see you, but you can see me. <laughs> anyway, let's carry on. Um, uh, should we have the video notices, please? Right now, I think in the world, there's only two things that never change. Uh, one is God's character, and the other is God's word. 
it's so important that we're able to hold on to what is unshakable and that is the word of God the word of God gives life gives hope and shares truth we live in a society that struggles to find the truth so listening to the word of God knowing that this word is coming from God himself is incredibly powerful this year besides listening to the book of Matthew we can also watch the book of Matthew it is called the gospel film this gospel film is very special because the Bible is the script it's going to be about whole Hong Kong churches coming together. And there is power when the community of believers come together to read the word together. The Bible was meant to be heard collectively. This is the most important time more than ever that we need to unify as churches, as Christians, because there's only one church in Hong Kong. To have the spiritual strength and knowledge we need to be able to be a witness for our generation. As we experience one word, one church, one city, one Lord. Hello, I'm Tom Yip. Oh, hello, Nick White. Oh, I'm Yuki. Aaron Tan. Bala Krishnan. My name is Eric. Devanjo. Paul Mack. Stephen McDougall. Hunter Purvis. Monty Peterson. One. 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 In the One 2020 Hearing the Word campaign. That's all for today's notices. Have a great service. So I think a few things to highlight. Um, do uh, pay attention to the one that is coming up for Lent. Um, I know a lot of us joined it last year, and it was really encouraging. So we'll have more news about that later. Um, and also for Lent, um, the special book that was advertised um, with uh, some artwork and reflections and um, Cecilia uh, will be helping us to order that. So um, she needs to put in the orders early, though. So if you're interested in that book, I think she has a sample copy to show you. You can go and see her at the end of the service at the back um, and make your order early so that we can get them in time for Lent. Um, also, uh, we're having a collection of uh, masks and hand sanitizers uh, for those in need, especially the people in the Methodist Center, which has all kinds of uh, social outreach things for old people, young people, people in need. Um, and they are very short of these kind of things like masks and hand sanitizers. Um, so if you do have a few spare ones, um, it would be wonderful if you could just share a few, maybe put them in a Ziploc bag and bring them to the counter. Uh, uh, each Sunday over the next few weeks. Um, not about this service, but about the 9.30 service. Um, we, we actually are going to be suspending the 9.30 service for a few weeks um, because of the particular situation um, that's going on at the moment. We're going to reduce the number of services. However, the 11 o'clock service that we're in now, it will continue to run as usual, and you'll be able to watch it on Facebook Live as well. Stay tuned to the website that, so that we all know what's going on. Um, also, please, uh, if you're not feeling well, um, please don't come to the service um, because we, you, <laughs> you have the, the Facebook Live so that we can watch it at home so we won't be missing anything. Um, and we have a new member called Heather, and she's going to come and share a very encouraging um, message with us. Hello, I'm Heather Smith. Yeah. Um, I started coming on your nativity 
service. My goodness, I've never seen anything like it. That was incredible. <laughs> if you want to bring people to church, wow, that got me hooked. Um, <laughs> I've been in Hong Kong for 27 years. I live in Sai Kung, so I've been worshiping there, but I really wanted to join a Methodist church. That's my original family background, and that's what I wanted to share with you today. My, my mother uh, worships at the United Methodist Church in upstate New York, Saratoga Springs, New York. And every time I go back, I, I worship w- with her at that church. And the people there have asked me, what's going on? Is everything okay? What can we do? And what they've decided to do is to write letters and cards, and the kids are going to draw pictures and send them to our church to offer their encouragement and their prayers for us and for Hong Kong. So let me just read you a little bit from a letter my mother wrote to um, Pastor Eden. Hi, I'm the mother of Heather Smith. Um, When visiting me in the States, Heather makes our United Methodist Church in Saratoga Springs her American home Methodist Church. She's well known by many of our congregation, and members have expressed concern over the situation in Hong Kong. We recognize the great anxiety and hardship your people are experiencing as a complex result of the coronavirus outbreak, and we wish to send all of you our thoughts and prayers. Last Sunday, I presented to our congregation the idea of sending cards and letters, and it was enthusiastically embraced. For the next few weeks, I will be sending you envelopes with the cards and messages that have been written. The first envelope was sent today in Christian love, Camilla Smith. So we have a sister church in the U.S. who's thinking of us, praying for us, and soon, I hope, we'll be sending cards and letters and that we'll post somewhere, um, maybe in the foyer, so when you come in, you can read the prayers and thoughts of our sister church, Christians across the ocean. Thank you. Thanks, Heather. Isn't that just so encouraging to know that we have a sister church who's praying for us? It's wonderful. Um, I'd like to extend a special welcome to anybody who's uh, worshipping with us for the first time. Um, Could you raise your hand if you're here for the first time, and then we can come around and give you a welcome pack and uh, uh, just say a welcome to you, anybody? Okay, well, um, we'll continue our service with the offering. testing and there is suffering you can do extraordinary things in those times and we see that all around us we thank you for those who have concern for us and to express that practically through writing notes and cards and letters 
for other ways that creativity is flourishing and flowing. The opportunity of reaching out to many more people than our usual Sunday worship. Father, you can use these situations to bring about goodness, mercy, and to show us your love. And so we never want to stop showing you our love either. And we do that in part by giving you gifts of money, uh, that you might take them and bless them and, and use it for your kingdom, which is absolutely coming and is coming amongst us. And we're certain of that. So, Father, take this gift of money and take the gift of our lives. Use them to bring about your extraordinary blessing in these days and always. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. We're not going to read the whole of chapters 6 to 8 in Genesis. We're going to hear some selected verses from, first of all, chapter 6. And then after our hymn, uh, chapter 8, uh, Joshua is going to come and lead our first Bible reading from Genesis chapter 6. The first Bible reading is taken from Genesis chapter 6, verses 9 to 14, 17 to 22. Noah was a righteous man. Blameless in his generation, Noah walked with God, and Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Now, the earth was corrupt in God's sight, and the earth was filled with violence. And God saw that the earth was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted its ways upon the earth. And God said to Noah, I have determined to make an end of all flesh, for the earth is filled with violence because of them. Now I am going to destroy them along with the earth. Make yourself an ark of cypress wood. Make rooms in the ark and cover it inside and out with pitch. For my part, I am going to bring a flood of waters on the earth. To destroy from under heaven all flesh in which is the breath of life. Everything that is on the earth shall die. But I will establish my covenant with you. And you shall come into the ark. You, your sons, your wife, and your sons' wives with you. And of every living thing of all flesh. You shall bring two of every kind into the ark to keep them alive with you. They shall be male and female, of the birds according to their kinds, and of the animals according to their kinds, of every creeping thing of the ground according to its kind. Two of every kind shall come into you to keep them alive. Also, take with you every kind of food that is eaten, and store it up. And it shall serve as food for you and for them. Noah did this. He did all that God commanded him. Our next hymn reminds us that God can be trusted in the past, being our strength and can be trusted for now and for the future. Let's stand and sing, O God, our help in ages past.
Our second Bible reading is taken from Genesis 8, verses 1 and 15 to 22. But God remembered Noah and all the wild animals and all the domestic animals that were with him in the ark. And God made a wind blow over the earth, and the waters subsided. Then God said to Noah, Go out of the ark, you and your wife, and your sons and your sons' wives with you. Bring out with you every living thing that is with you of all flesh, birds and animals and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth, so that they may abound on the earth and be fruitful and multiply on the earth. So Noah went out with his sons and his wife and his sons' wives, and every animal, every creeping thing, and every bird, everything that moves on the earth, went out of the ark by families. Then Noah built an altar to the Lord, and took of every clean animal and of every clean bird, and offered burnt offerings on the altar. And when the Lord smelled the pleasing odor, the Lord said in his heart, I will never again curse the ground because of humankind, for the inclination of the human heart is evil from youth, nor will I ever again destroy every living creature as I have done. As long as the earth endures, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night shall not cease. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks Thanks be be to God. God.
Thanks to Laura and Gary. It's a beautiful song. Thank you very much for sharing it with us today. Let's pray together as we come to hear God's word. Father, we've lived through and we're living through difficult days, but almost every day we see signs of your love. Almost as if that dove is coming to us in all sorts of different ways. Help us to open our eyes to to see those moments of joy, of celebration, of giving and receiving, of generosity, of prayer, of love. Father, as we come together today, may you open your word to us. You've called us here to hear your word. So, Father, may we open our ears and our hearts and our minds to listen and to receive what it is you have to say to us today. That we might be blessed and challenged, inspired and healed. And we pray this through the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Well, welcome. It's good to see so many of you here today. Uh, Welcome for braving it out into the world and here together, gathering together. As you know, many churches have closed their services for today and uh, next Sunday, if not the Sunday after. But I think it's good for us to be together for now. We'll see how things go. Please keep your eyes on the website, on our Facebook site. We will post things uh, during the week if The situation changes, as as Caroline's already said. We won't meet at 9.30, but we will meet at 11 o'clock next week at the moment. But please keep your eyes on our website or phone in if you're unsure. Well, over the last past uh, four weeks, our fifth week now, we've been looking at that theme in the beginning, an exploration of the early chapters of the book of Genesis the stories that reveal something of God's uh, act, God's provision, God's sovereignty over all things. We have marveled at God's awesome creative dynamic energy seen in the beauty and wonder of all that surrounds us in creation. As I was writing this, I was thinking, gosh, you know, we've lived through such difficult days over the past few months. But, you know, Hong Kong is still such a beautiful place. It really is. Uh, As I said at 9.30, every time I cross the harbour on a ferry, and I try to do that more than taking the MTR, because I love the ferries. And there's seldom a time when I cross the harbour without taking photos like I'm a a tourist. (laughs) I love it. It's a marvellous picture of Hong Kong. When the sun is shining, what better place is there to be? Hong Kong remains a very beautiful place. I still love the walk between Deepwater Bay and Repulse Bay, not only because it's so flat, but because the scenery is so beautiful. And I love to take that walk in the sun with my dog now. And I love the skyscrapers in Central, and I walk amongst them and uh, in awe and wonder at what man has been able to do. So as we go through these difficult days, I know it's hard for us. But don't forget, we live in an extraordinarily beautiful place where I consider a great privilege and pleasure to be, even through these difficult days. So we reflected on God creating, God creating all that we see around us, and that through creation, we actually see God when we open our eyes. We can see God, and that's the point of it too in the intricacy, the delicacy, and the beauty, and the wonder, and the awesomeness, and the power, we see God. Then we reflected upon God, uh, God's joy as he created man and woman, himself reaching down to the dust and dirt of the earth, and sculpting with his own hands, man, breathing his very breath into this sculpture. And so it comes alive with the breath, and the essence of God. So in each other, we see something of God. Don't forget that. We've considered the selfishness of Adam and Eve, of eating of the fruit of the the tree of knowledge and opening the way for sin to enter, of Cain's rage and anger at the rejection of his own offering when Abel, his brother's offering, was received and well-regarded by God, And we saw how Cain's anger, uh, when left unchecked, uh, and that rage would eventually drive him to murder his own brother in cold blood. 
an act which condemns Cain to the status of a fugitive forever, wandering the face of the earth with the mark of God so nobody would kill him. He would live a long life of suffering. And now today, we turn to the well-known story of Noah and his ark, a story beloved by children and movie makers alike. And it was uh, on Thursday morning as I, uh, I sat down to begin to write this sermon, and I was praying through the story as I read it in the chapter 6 to 8, and thinking about it, and think of these months of living through uh, times of struggle and difficulty in Hong Kong, um, uh, and, and through the protests and now the, the health uh, issue. Uh, and I read in the paper that morning, you know, 60,000 now infected with the coronavirus. And I, I looked up from my Bible, and out from the window, I saw the sky turn black. You remember, Thursday morning. And then the heavens opened, and there was a deluge of rain came down, pouring down. My dog was barking and going wild. And I began to wonder if God was trying to tell me something. And further wondered if it was too late for me to build the ark. I think it was. Well, the the rain subsided and we haven't been flooded. The story of Noah is a story that many of us perhaps learnt in Sunday school. For, for what a great story it is. I mean, it's, a, it's for kids, it's thrilling, and it's, it's a filled with adventure. Wonderful story to tell. It pictures, as King did so well this morning with his rainbow. For some, it's the story of a flood and of God's anger with the people who were, to, who were all uh, evil, we're told. And for others, it's the story of the rainbow, of God's redemptive grace of allowing humanity another chance. Even today, film and movie makers continue to churn out movies based on the story of Noah. Some of you may have watched or remember Evan Almighty in 2007 with Steve Carell and uh, God played by the godlike Morgan Freeman offering the voice. Uh, and in more recent days, 2014, I think is the most recent Noah movie, aptly called Noah. <laughs> but the historian Russell Crowe, anybody see that movie? One or two of you, yes. Uh, the, the reviewers panned it. <laughs> they didn't like it. One of them said, Noah, the movie is an unholy mess, drawing in a drowning in unbiblical detail. Well, these days, never let facts get in the way of a good story, eh? The danger with such an epic story and how we first receive it as little children is that it remains just that for many of us. A children's story to be read at bedtime. And the unbiblical movies which we later rush out to see are just that. They are unbiblical, not accurate, not according to scripture. And often we watch them and accept that story as if it is biblical true. That's it. That's how it was. That's God's word. But that's God's word as told by Hollywood. And we need to get back to the original story. What does the text say to us? What does the author who put this story together want to tell us about God and about creation? What does he want to tell us about God's plan and God's sovereignty and the dealing with He's dealing with humanity. So three things. Of course, there are many points in Noah. You can tell me all the points I've missed later. Uh, But the three I want to look at today. One, the wickedness of humanity is very great. And people's hearts are full of, of evil. Secondly, God's patience does come to an end. God's patience does come to an end. And God does not surrender his purpose in creating humanity. He doesn't give up his ultimate plan, even with that flood and with Noah. So, the wickedness of humanity is very great. Hearts are full of evil. And you know, our capacity to sin is extraordinary. Our capacity to take something that's really good and corrupt it never fails to amaze me. That I have at times allowed this to happen in my own life shames me, quite frankly. 
You know, there are so many wonderful, extraordinary things that humanity has discovered and that we continue to discover. Science, medicine, technology. I, I am astounded, you know, all these scientists and medical professionals working round the clock to identify the virus that we're presently encountering and now to find a cure, a vaccine. It is extraordinary the speed at which they can do all this uh, and the way that they are working. What we can do as human beings is extraordinary. It's incredible. But how often have we managed to take something really good, beneficial for humanity, and turn it into something really, really wicked and evil? January the 27th, Uh, Recently was the 70th anniversary of the liberation of Auschwitz in Poland. The Nazi death camps within which somewhere around, nobody's quite sure, but around one and a half million, mainly Jews, Jewish people were murdered. Many of them gassed or tortured or beaten or starved or experimented upon. Medical doctors trained to save lives carried out unspeakable acts operations and surgeries on mentally or physically disabled men, women and children. The horrors of such a place uh, reveal the utter depths of depravity that sin will take us to if we allow it, if we give it free reign in our lives, if we do not guard ourselves. That sin is something we constantly have to wrestle with. It's clear, as God said to Cain, and we remembered last week, when Cain was so upset that his offering had not been received by God, no regard by God, God said, you know, Cain's sin lurks at the door, and you must master it. And as I added, or it will master you. And that is so true. Either we master sin, or it will master us. It will take over our lives. And as we know, even St. Paul, a great uh, writer and evangelist, said of himself in Romans 7, For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of the flesh, sold into the slavery of sin. I do not understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing that I hate. And you can hear his frustration, and it's our frustration too at times, isn't it? We want to live good lives. We want to do the right thing. But somehow, sin takes us and captures us and forces us to do the very thing that we don't want to do. We have to wrestle and we have to work. How many times have you heard yourself say, I am never going to do that again. I'm never going to allow myself to get into that situation. Maybe even after emerging from some sinful place, unnoticed and unscathed. (gasps) Nobody noticed. But all too often, you are right back there, in that place, doing that thing, speaking those words, enjoying that which is forbidden and wrong. From the very beginning, it seems it was so. The serpent tempting Eve taunting her, whispering in her ear, come, try, taste. It's so sweet, it's so beautiful. Nobody will notice. It's not wrong, nothing bad will happen. Taste the sweetness. Enjoy. And all too soon, the fruit was tasted and the grip of sin closed, vice-like, over humanity and a whole new world opened up. But it wasn't a good place. The world of sin is never a good place to be. Sin entered into the beautiful world God had created. Division, separation, enmity, selfishness and greed, corruption and injustice. No longer to walk innocently, naked, in the cool of the evening, in paradise with God. Rather, cast out to toil and to struggle in hardship and suffering. And so from Adam and Eve and Cain and Lamech and all the others, sin spread, gathering momentum, destroying what God had created, turning goodness into fear and creativity into barrenness and beautiful open gardens of paradise into walled, closed cities. In the time of Noah, God looked and saw that all people were wicked. 
They were filled with evil. What must have filled God's heart to see that? When humanity ate of the forbidden fruit and allowed sin in, what must God have felt? What must have his, his heart have felt like for these creatures, these people, these children he had created with his own hand, breathed his own life, his own essence into them? What must he have felt? I think if you have ever had a wayward son or daughter, you might know something, something of what God felt. I've met the father, in fact I've met two fathers in my ministry, whose sons had become uh, enslaved or addicted to drugs, and whose lives had spiraled down and out of control until the point came at last when one of those fathers had to say with a a very heavy, saddened heart, I can have no more to do with you. You must leave and not come back. If you've ever been in that situation, you will know what that's like, but I can't imagine that. But that's something of what God felt in his heart when we turned away from him. And with God too, that point eventually comes. The point when the pathway that we have chosen through our own sin, our own selfishness, our own greed of allowing sin to master us leads us to a place of separation, destruction even, when the waters cover over us. And maybe some of us have experienced that before too. The story tells us God's patience does run out and he will uh, will let us go that pathway that we choose. If we choose that path, that's ours to choose, to eat the fruit, to allow sin to enter in. In the story of Noah, the floodwaters rose and creation went effectively into reverse. In the beginning, from out of chaos, God separated things, heavens and earth, night and day, land and sea, animals, birds and fish and trees and all living things. Now, the heavens opened with a deluge. Floodwaters rose, covering the land, swamping animals and vegetation. Chaos returned. It was creation in reverse. We must not think that we can forever go on sinning. And always be forgiven. That God's arms will always be wide open to welcome us home from our far away wayward journey of wild living. No. No. We like to talk about grace abounding. My predecessor Howard wrote endless books on grace. And it's a key aspect of Methodism, of course. We we cherish grace. Where would we be without God's grace? But it will not always be so. God's patience will run out. We will be held accountable. If we take the wayward journey, the path that leads away from God, it might forever lead us away from God. The New Testament is alive with stories, as you know. We read them through Advent and other times too. We'll read them in Lent. uh, uh, Full of stories of judgment. Preparing, helping to prepare us, telling us to prepare. Get ready for our eternal future. To not build up treasures on earth, but but treasures in heaven. Of throwing off all that hinders us from following God. Of living in such a way as to please God that there is an end in sight. Jesus tells us he will come again. And just as the, the flood carried away all the wicked and evil people, so Christ will carry with him all those who are seeking to serve him and love him and follow him and be his disciples who are righteous. Noah was the one man of his day who God looked favorably upon. The one man who walked with God, we're told, who was blameless. And to him, God gave the task of repopulating the earth for although humanity had become inherently evil, God would not give up on his ultimate plan. He would see that plan through to its conclusion. 
to establish a, a human community of faithful, loving men and women to enjoy fellowship with, to walk in the garden with, and enjoy the company of. God would not give this up, even in the face of such evil and wickedness. God would and will always see his plans through to fruition, to completion. So Noah was instructed to build his ark of cypress wood and gather the family and animals, a remnant of the earth. And once the flood had come up and then receded, he and his family would repopulate the earth. But of course, God was not so foolish as to know that Noah or his sons and descendants wouldn't sin again. Of course they would. In fact, Noah, he would plant his vineyard once he got out of the ark and it would grow over the years and then eventually it would sprout fruit and he would make the fruit into wine and he would get absolutely paralytic drunk, bringing shame and disgrace upon himself and his family. Noah could only save a few and only from the flood another man would be needed to save humanity from sin, to restore the broken relationship with God and give us power to master sin. And that man's name is Jesus. You know, the St. Andrew's Daily Missal explains the symbolism of Noah and, and uh, the ark and Jesus and the cross. It writes, it says this, it was the wood of the ark which saved the human race. And it is that of the cross which in its turn saves the world. Thou alone, says the church, speaking of the cross, has been found worthy to be for this shipwrecked world the ark which brings safely into port. The cross, not the ark. The cross of wood planted firmly in the earth will save us. Because of what Christ has done upon the cross. It will bring us safely into the port, which this speaks about, which is heaven. It is through the cross of Christ that we can find forgiveness for our sins. More than that, that we might discover the strength and help to overcome those sins when they come at us. Sins which separate us from God, sins which can separate us from other people who we love, and sins which can lead us along a pathway that leads to destruction of our own making. You know, an important part of early Methodism uh, and the experience of Methodists was for, uh, to meet in small groups, uh, classes, band meetings, or larger meetings. And part of the reason for meeting in these groups was to, to pray together, uh, to study the Bible together, to have fellowship together, all these things in this group. And to confess sins to each other. And that's a big part of the Roman Catholic uh, Church and way of doing things. We don't do it so much in our own church, but there's actually a great power in confessing our sins to others. You know, in that small group of fellowship, and, and a Bible study, scripture, to confess our sins is to kind of almost lift that burden that we're carrying solely ourselves and allow others to share it with us and to pray for us and to be our strength. I've said before, my brother-in-law is a recovering alcoholic. He's very open about all that. And he realized he was an alcoholic when he couldn't get by without having a drink in the morning or in the evening or during the daytime. And thank God he, he got to a point when he knew he had to do something about it. And so he joined AA. And AA works very like this. It's the confession of who you are, of what you're doing and what you've done. And that you want to be changed. He will say he will always be a recovering alcoholic, as I or you will always be a recovering sinner, perhaps. But to share it and be part of a group of fellowship that strengthens each other and supports each other and says, yes, I know what you're going through because I go through it too, but I'm here. And when you need me, I'm here. When, when you, I need you, you'll be here for me. And that's what we can do too together 
sin comes at us in all sorts of ways. And with higher or lower levels of power and strength. To confess our sins to others may well be a, a powerful way of helping us to deal with it and to move on from it. Some of you here or listening today, wherever you might be, might need that kind of help to overcome whatever it is that has captured you in its vice-like grip. Then seek that help, that support. Be prayed for. Be strengthened by sharing with one another. And don't let sin hold you captive any longer. And you know, sin is so pervasive. It comes at us every day and all day. So we have to be on our guard all the time. Walking closely with Christ, studying His Word, praying together, fellowshipping together, worshipping together. And we can't do it on our own. Not even in a small group. We cannot overcome our sin on our own. We cannot pay for that sin to be dealt with. Only Christ has done that for us. Christ died on the cross to take your sin and my sin upon himself, dying and rising again. He overcame the power of sin and death for you and for me for all time. Do not let sin, like a great flood, wash you away or submerge you. Rather, be saved, be redeemed through the precious blood of Jesus on the cross. Sadly, through human selfishness and greed, our world is is fallen and sin is at work everywhere. We see that full well all around us all the time. But Christ through the cross is restoring and renewing So be part of that renewal. Be part of that new heaven and that new kingdom that is surely coming. Yes, the heart of man is evil. Yes, God's patience will run out. But God has made a way that all may be saved. So come to Christ today. I implore you for myself and lay those sins before Him, trusting in the power of the cross And the blood of Jesus which cleanses and restores and renews and revives. And walk in his way, trusting him now and in all the days that lie ahead. And I pray this in his precious name. Amen. Let's pray together for a minute. And then we'll sing. This is God's word to us today. Not my word, it's God's word. But maybe it's touched some of our hearts. Maybe it's made us think of certain things. Maybe we are dealing with a sin that we're struggling with. Maybe it's an addiction of some sort that we keep going back to again and again and again. And we can't break free from it. Maybe it's something that God has just laid on our heart now. Something that we do need to be set free from. Something that we need the power of Jesus and his cross to help us overcome. And you know there's so much in our society at the moment. So much fear. Fear is not of God. God is perfect love and he drives out that fear. But sometimes we are overwhelmed with fear. And sometimes that fear is because we don't trust in God. We're struggling. Perhaps there are things that have been laid upon our heart that we have struggled for a long time with. And I believe today... God wants to give you the power to overcome. God wants to set you free. Let 
And so as we're just in this time of prayer, I'm going to invite you to stand with me. Anybody who would like to be prayed with specifically? I'm just going to invite you to stand where you are. And I'm going to say a prayer for us. I am standing because I too need help. So please stand now if you'd like and I'm going to pray with you. We'll pray together. Holy Spirit, we thank you for your presence here this morning. We thank you for bringing the word of our holy God to us today and convicting us and challenging us. And so we stand before you, knowing that you, holy God, amazingly are in this place. And even those who are watching can know your holy presence from wherever they are. Father, you know our hearts. You know the things which we struggle with or have struggled with. The sin that seems to entangle itself around us so often and we we give in to temptation. Maybe things that have been done to us in the past that we can't let go of. And we harbor and they fester within our lives. That in itself, it's a sin. So often we're people full of fear, anxious and worried. And those things are sinful too because they deny that you are our God and we can trust in you. So Father, I just pray you come by your Holy Spirit now. Come upon every one of our lives as we stand here today. Come and reveal to us the power of the risen Lord Jesus. Come and cleanse us with the blood of Jesus to set us free. Because we can't be set free in our own strength, but only in the strength of Jesus Christ. God, we thank you that the cross before us is empty because Christ rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and he prays for us now. And he sends the Holy Spirit upon us to cleanse and heal and restore and strengthen and empower. So Holy Spirit of God, come. Come upon each of our lives. Come and bring your healing balm into our hearts. Come and bring us release. Come and bring us that strength and that power of the cross. God, you are God above all things. You are sovereign God over all creation, over every human life, over all that is and all that will be. Restore our confidence in you again, I pray, O God, that we can walk in the powerful name of Jesus to conquer sin, to overcome all that tempts us and tests us, to be set free, to truly be the disciples Jesus calls us to be. So, Holy Spirit of God, come and fall afresh upon us now as we recognize that in our midst there is a higher throne that is yours, God. So come and do your work in our lives, we pray, to your praise and for your glory in the powerful name of Jesus Christ our Lord. And to him be all praise and glory now and forever. Amen. Amen. Let's sing that song. There is a higher throne.
intercessional prayers. When I say, Lord, in your mercy, please respond with, hear our prayer. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. In the power of the Spirit and in, in union with Christ, let us pray to the Father. Heavenly Father, thank you for the beautiful example of Noah, who was a man who believed in you, trusted your word, obeyed your instructions, and found grace in your eyes because of his faith. Lord, thank you for the forgiveness of sin and your precious blood shed for our salvation. Allow us, O Lord, to proclaim the glorious gospel of grace to the lost and let our lives be a witness to your goodness and grace and a warning of the wrath that is to come. Mm. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, we join all the community around the world in prayer for those who died and affected by the ongoing coronavirus outbreak. We pray for your comfort for the bereaved and healing for those infected. May the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, guard their hearts and minds in Jesus Christ. We pray for our God to strengthen and sustain them. Mm-hmm. And for all of us, we pray for the protection and for God's mercy to stop the spread of the virus both in China and around the world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, we pray for all Christians of the world to hold fast to God's promises, to stay strong and courageous. May all Christians show forth the love of God and for all people to be witness of the Lord in time of crisis. Mm. Heavenly Father, we pray for our church MIC, our pastors, our leaders, our small group ministries, and all the members that we may be united, support and grow our faith together. We are humbled to know that more and more lives are being touched by your word through MIC radio and live streaming program. We ask you to strengthen all of us so that we can faithfully witness our Lord Jesus Christ, lead more people to follow his way in your kingdom, and proclaim your love through serving, especially in times of many challenges in our communities. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, we lift to you the many young people and students that are attending the primary, secondary, colleges, and university whom their activities were interrupted as part of the government measures. Many students, particularly in China, are currently restricted to return to their overseas schools and universities. Be with them, O Lord. Please help them to turn frustration into an inspiration to wait for you to act in your own time and in, in your unique way, knowing that suffering in this life produces perseverance, mm-hmm. endurance, and patience, and character that help us to be more trusting and faithful in you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, we pray for those who are dear to us and who are in any kind of need. We pray for our brothers and sisters that are living in time of much need and economic hardship. There are many today who are facing the shock of having lost their job with little hope of securing a new position. Lord, often this causes much deep emotional pressure and affect relationship with loved ones. Lord, we pray that you look on them with compassion and pray that you will provide for their needs and secure each one a new work. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Let us observe a moment of silence as we pray for our individual concerns. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Amen. Amen. 
The fact that uh, so many of us, maybe all of us, stood to be prayed with reminds us we're all in this together. So don't be afraid of uh, seeking out people to talk to or be prayed with. Uh, people are always here after our service. We'll pray with you. Uh, we're all in this together. It's a journey we're journeying with, uh, with each other, but Christ at the heart. So don't be afraid of going to talk to people and being prayed with. Uh, and with people here, if you would like to be prayed with today, they'll be at the front after our service. We're going to sing our final hymn of praise, a hymn that reminds us of the amazing faithfulness of God. Let's receive this hymn as God's words to us, as he is faithful to us now. Great is thy faithfulness. Thank you for your amazing faithfulness. All that we have needed, you provide. Every morning, there are new mercies available to us. And we praise you and we thank you for that. And we thank you for the mercies that you've showered upon us today. So, Father, may we leave this place to walk in your grace and mercy and love until you call us home, until we see you face to face in all your greatness and power and majesty. And then we wonder... Why did we ever fear? So may the blessing of God, God the Father, and God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit rest and remain with you, and with all whom you love, wherever they may be today, and in all that lies ahead. Amen. Amen.